Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Is this thing on? Um, Welcome, everybody, to the Smithsonian American Art Museum. My name is Michael Mansfield. I'm the curator of film and media art here and, uh, and also the curator of the exhibition Watch This, Revelations in Media Art. Um, it's not lost on me that it's a beautiful day outside, so thank you very much for coming into a dark theater and into a dark gallery space. Um, but I think that the work in there is really exciting, uh, so I hope that it's worth it. Um, uh, certainly, tonight's program is going to be uh, going to be worth it. I'm joined on stage tonight by uh, three very important and excellent artists um, that I like very much. So uh, there's no place I'd rather be. If I could be on any stage in the world tonight, it's this one. <laughs> um, but we also have a lot of competition tonight. I understand that there's uh, this museum you may have heard of opening in New York called the Whitney Museum of American Art, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're all here. Um, I wanted to take a quick moment to, uh, to, to thank a few of our supporters and sponsors and, um, uh, for their generous enthusiasm for our program, uh, Altria, the Altria Group, and uh, the Smithsonian Council for American Art have both been um, really supportive with my uh, rather modest media arts program, which is not so modest anymore. Um, but, uh, and I'd also like to thank our, our director, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Brun, who couldn't be here tonight, but uh, sends her regards. Her, her support of our program has also been really uh, energizing. Um, uh, tonight's program, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the exhibition. I hope you've had an opportunity to walk up there and walk through the show. Um, uh, but I'm going to give a brief introduction to the show and sort of the organizing principles that were behind its, uh, its arrangement. Um, and then I'm going to ask the artists to step up here on stage and uh, give a brief uh, introduction to each of them, um, uh, which I'm sure you'll find very interesting. And I'll also, also describe the works that are uh, their works, which are in the exhibition. Um, and then I'm going to pose a question for each of them, a very simple question, um, each of them individually that they can respond to and uh, start a dialogue uh, among the three of us. Um, but then I'd like, to, I'd like to leave time at the end of that for a discussion among all of you, so I encourage you to, uh, to listen very carefully and, and ask questions. Um, this is very much supposed to be a, a, a very friendly conversation here in the room. Um, I'll say that uh, a bit of housekeeping, when you do have a question, please go up to the microphones, uh, which are on either side in the middle of the uh, theater here. Uh, one, so that uh, everyone can hear your question, and two, so that we can, uh, we can see who you are. Um, so, any questions before we begin? <laughs> um, art and artists alike have long engaged the most advanced materials and techniques, techniques afforded them, inventing new strategies and devices that may better express their creative vision. This is clearly reflected in traditional arts, such as painting and sculpture and photography and craft. Each one is an accept, accepted expressive medium that incorporates the contemporary materials of the day. This is true throughout the history of art. Sculptural, sculpture regularly assumes new materials from, from uh, casting to carving to pointing an assemblage. Painting is both a verb and a noun and reinvents itself at every turn. Photography once employed glass plate negatives and now no negative at all. Non-traditional media, media art, so what? After all, invention and innovation in the artist practice have always been matters of settled tradition. Watch this, Revelations in Media Art, is, an organi is organized as an invitation to examine this newly diverse range of material and conceptual exchanges between artists and technology that is both a testament to the fantastic advancements in electronics, but also the cultural meanings embedded in them. And these works offer a striking disclosure of the ambitions they engender, fueling a range of aesthetic styles, formal practices, and conceptual engagements that together empower artists to confront the complex histories of the present and to inspire new futures. I arranged this panel this evening to present the work of these three artists and, and uh, to learn something about them and their work myself. Um, I'm very excited about the artistic exchange that they have with technology and the way that it, technology informs their artistic practices. Um, but their, uh, 
Their work touches not only on electronics and components that are uh, created elsewhere, but also inventive and inventing new devices and, and uh, technologies themselves to uh, better realize their, their production. Creative and commercial innovations in high fidelity stereo, broadcast television, videotape, satellite technologies, conceived in the 1940s, ignited a frenetic pace of social change through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, simultaneously shattering and shaping modes of expression and communication. From the 1980s into the present millennium, the electronic age burst through to the digital age, advancing in previously inconceivable directions at blinding speeds, opening entirely new terrain for creative explorations. Today, motherboards, video games, cellular communications, and smartphones continue to transform ideas of historiography, representation, and access, not to mention velocity and possession, both publicly and privately, locally and officially. Artists have encountered these technological leaps with complete impunity. And within them, they have shaped an extraordinary rebellion that continuously redefines how we imagine, receive, and understand our time. Theodore Adorno wrote in 1970 that the rebellion against semblance, art's dissatisfaction with itself, has been an intermittent element of its claim to truth from time immemorial. Media art realizes this confrontation with semblance. The practice is one that defies and redefines the formerly fixed boundaries of traditional artistic disciplines, such as painting, sculpture, and photography, weaving it with theater, performance, and literature. It's one that challenges all previously settled conformities of expression. And their fearless embrace of contemporary materials is a striking disclosure. It's either optimistic or insidious or both. It fuels a range of aesthetic styles and formal practices that together empower artists to confront the complex histories of the present and inspire new futures, which I've said twice, which just tells you how much, how important that is. <laughs> um, each of the works uh, in the show were chosen very carefully, but uh, so were the three artists that I invited here tonight. Um, uh, I'm first, actually I'm gonna ask them all to come up on stage now, um, so I can uh, introduce them uh, properly to you. Uh, my slides are not working. Um, I don't know if it's been blanked or not. Hello? This wouldn't be any fun if uh, everything worked properly. No. Well, there's Rico Gatson's work back there. <laughs> Here we go. Let's try this again. Don't you have to go to slideshow, Michael? Yeah. Well, I was in there. And it wasn't, I exited wasn't it out. It? Here we go. There you go. Okay. This is the name of the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a slide I was supposed to be on earlier. Um, and this is the first artist that I'm going to introduce you. Uh, Eve Sussman, uh, who I've gotten to know a little bit over the last couple of years is a Brooklyn-based artist, a multi-dimensionally talented artist uh, working in cinema, film, video installation, sculpture, and photography. She has organized large-scale exhibitions, art productions through various film and art collectives, namely Rufus Corporation, which has been described as a 60-era 60 60s era evil think tank meets traveling circus, uh, and more recently has founded the Wallabout Oyster Theater. Uh, with, her, with her husband and partner, Simon Lee, who is here, so he might wave. Um, she has conceived and written and directed major moving picture and motion picture works, such as 89 Seconds at Alcazar in 2004, The Rape of the Sabine Women in 2007, as well as produced, executive produced a number of projects, including uh, um, Ruby Lee and, I'm sorry. Jack and Lee Ruby. Sorry? Jack and Lee Ruby. Jack and Lee Ruby's car wash incident, which I think is really kind of a fantastic piece. It's installed right now in Detroit, so if you make a, a trip west, please go and see it. Um, most recently, even, even Simon uh, completed filming part one for uh, No Food, No Money, No Jewels at MPAC in Troy, New York. White on White, Algorithmic Noir, which was completed in 2011, uh, uh, we acquired just a couple of, uh, just last year. Um, 
And it's on view upstairs with its uh, partner in crime, Yuri's office, which is a film set from its construction. Um, the film, ever so briefly described as a digital cinema installation, is an experimental film, noir, composed from two screens, one reflecting the movie and one just depicting the computer program behind the movie. In making the film, the collective traveled between Moscow and the Caspian Sea, compiling a cinematic record of the landscape, the environment, the architecture, while filming in local cafes, apartment blocks, and industrial plants. An extensive audiovisual library composed of 3,000 film clips, 80 voiceovers, and 150 scores of music forms the basis of the film. A non-linear narrative unfolds through the observations and surveillance of the central protagonist, Holtz, who finds himself living in a dystopian futurophilus. But further provoking cinematic form, the film's presentation is edited in real time by a custom programmed computer that Sussman has labeled the serendipity machine. The work is driven by keywords that appear on the secondary screen and delivers a changing narrative that runs indefinitely, never playing the same sequence of imagery twice. The unexpected juxtapositions of voice, image, and sound create a sense of unyielding suspense in the movie that continuously divorces the protagonist from the full course of his own narrative. Um, so it's a brief description of the film, uh, but it's really certainly worth sitting, uh, sitting up there for uh, a couple hours watching it. <laughs> um, uh, the next artist on our panel is Camille Utterback, who I've also gotten to know uh, quite well over the last year or so. Um, she's an internationally acclaimed artist and pioneer in the field, field of digital and interactive art. Her work ranges from interactive gallery installations to intimate reactive sculptures, to architecturally scaled site-specific works. Um, I forgot I had slides after going through all that trouble. <laughs> Um, through architecturally uh, scaled site-specific works. Camille's work explores the aesthetic and experiential possibilities of link and computational systems to human movement and physicality in, the vi in visually layered ways. Her extensive exhibit history includes more than 50 shows on four continents. Recent awards include the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 2009, Transmedia International Media Arts Festival Award in 2005, the Rockefeller Foundation New Media Fellowship in 2002, and a Whitney Museum Commission for their Artport website also in 2002. Recently completed, completed public commissions include works for the Liberty Mutual Group for their, in 2013, the Foresight Foundation in 2012, the City of Sacramento, California in 2011, and also the City of San Jose, California in 2010, as well as the City of St. Louis Park, Minnesota in 2009. Utterback holds a BA in art from Williams College and a master's degree from the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. She's currently an assistant professor of art and the art history department at Stanford University. So that's Camille. Last year, I acquired Text Rain on view here for the first time upstairs in the exhibition. Um, and if you uh, look for the most active part of the gallery, with the most monkey business, that's probably uh, where text rain is. Um, it's really a groundbreaking interactive artwork conceived and created in 1999 that explores the correspondence between language and the body. The projection activates a living space of simultaneous reflection and activation as participants engage with the animated type from the poem Talk You by Evan Zimroth, jumbling the language of visual representation with the dynamics of spectatorship and inter interactivity Text Rain draws attention to the symbolic codes embedded in our machines, further compounding the spaces we inhabit, both virtually and physically. Reading the text puts viewers in unusual positions, quite literally creating figures of speech. Get it? As they move around. Um, that locate the sensation of a work of art within one's physical experience. The third artist on our panel is uh, David Berman. Um, this is a picture of David in 1979 as, we, uh, as he installed uh, cloud music at the Whitney. Um, David is an accomplished and influential composer and artist who's been active since the 1960s. His compositions and installations feature flexible structures and the use of technology in very personal ways. My dear Siegfried, leap pad, or leap day night, on the other ocean, long throw, interspecies, small talk, and open space with brass are among the works for soloists and small ensembles. 
He had long associations with the Merce Cunningham Dance Company, John Cage and David Tudor. And along with Alvin Lussier, Robert Ashley, and Gordon Muma in 1966, was a co-founder of the Sonic Arts Union, a collective of experimental artists. His multimedia installations have been exhibited at galleries and museums in the United States, as well as Europe. A recent orchest orchestral piece commissioned by the BBC Scottish Symphony titled How We Got Here was premiered in 2004. Audio recordings of his work are on uh, Pogus, New World, Wurgo, lovely, lovely music labels, and videos can be viewed at roulette.org and ubu.com. Just a few years ago, we acquired, oh, I should say that this, uh, I meant to pull this photograph up a little bit earlier. This is a photograph by Paula Court uh, at the kitchen during a performance in 2013 as David performed electronically. And I just love how it looks as though he's, he's, uh, he's working over there in the corner with a cup of coffee while, <laughs> while being serenaded. Um, <laughs> Um, in 2013, we acquired this landmark in the history of contemporary art and music called Cloud Music. Uh, created over a number of years from 1974 to 1979, Cloud Music is a synthesis of sound and image. And as a result of the collaboration between three artists, Robert Watts, David Berman, and Bob Diamond. It's a closed circuit video camera pointed at the sky. A video analyzer and audio, audio synthesizer read the image on a TV monitor, transforming, transforming the movement of the clouds and changing light into a score of music, transporting the natural environment into the gallery space for a new and immersive audiovisual experience. Visitors listen to video as a nature-driven event unfolding in real time. And as sound is composed from light, cloud music is once at once a conceptual as at once a conceptual homage to chance and a technological triumph that inspires new ways to experience the world. So uh, those are all three artists, so if you'll join me in a quick round of applause for, uh, for their work. Um, I will walk over. <laughs> uh, so welcome. I hope uh, you are having a good time in Washington, D.C. with our fine weather and uh, and the exhibition. Um, I wanted to pose a question uh, for each of you. I'm going to start with, uh, with Camille Utterback and, uh, and text Rain. Uh, we had a conversation, um, I think it's mine. Uh, we had a conversation about uh, the origins of text Rain and where it came from and how the relationship between uh, the computer system and, and uh, the, the camera sort of originated with that, the making of that work. And I was hoping you could describe that and, and uh, sort of the, the role that technology plays in your practice as an artist, both with that work but also with the work you're doing now. Sure. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just start. Um, Texturian obviously is a collaboration between myself and Romy Ashtov. I don't think it's here tonight. Um, it started, Romy had been working on a performance piece, uh, basically about how um, memory is grounded in our physical self, um, was my understanding of that piece. It was a dance piece. Um, but he was, and his collaborators were using technology to kind of illustrate these relationships. Uh, and so he had an idea that, uh, for the original beginning core of text reading, that there would be a text, a legible text, that you could read on the screen that would sort of disintegrate around someone's body. Um, and we were both colleagues at NYU together, and I have been doing a lot of projects, sort of concrete poetry experiments um, on screen, also about physicality. Um, so he asked me to collaborate with him on, on this piece. Um, so I started working on the actual programming of how we could get the camera input to create this, this visualization, which a lot of other people around at NYU at that time were working that way, Danny Rosen, Dan O'Sullivan. So I often, just as an aside, when working with technology, it's usually a lot of people involved in helping yeah. you get something done. I couldn't have done it without their support um, and prodding when I was like, oh my god, I'm yeah. going to give up on this. Uh, but as I was working on the installation on the floor of NYU, where we were students, um, it became really obvious that people, like as I started getting the prototypes going, it wasn't really, people didn't experience this as a text falling apart. They were constantly coming up with meanings. Like, oh, I read this, or it told me that, or I saw this. Um, so we ended up, for a variety of reasons, not using the piece in the performance that Roman was working on, but it kind of became an installation 
that took on a life of its own. And in that process, we also picked the poem, um, which also mm. was more about the slippage between language and physicality. So my favorite line from Evan's poem is, we are synonyms for limbs loosening of syntax and yet turn to nothing, it's just talk. Um, which this, to me, that there's a real visual component of that that is what um, you see when you watch people sort of using their bodies in the piece. Um, so let's see, so that's texture, that's sort of how, yeah. how things yeah. evolved. Um, and Romy and I had lots of back and forth about a lot of the different decisions in the piece and kind of how I think Michael knows now from setting it up to, it's, it's a big illusion, right? So I also think sometimes with technological work, people think it's like the technology that makes the piece. So obviously there's some computer vision stuff going on in that piece, but it's also the aesthetic decisions about what is the camera view and why do you, when you're in front of it, believe that you know you have this connection with the screen. Like we could have set right. up the screen really small and the camera view really wide and then people would walk right by and never notice that it's reacting to them. Um, so there's yeah. interest, I, I think sometimes people forget in these technology works how much else goes into to them often? No, I, I've, been, uh, I've been very careful when I've been describing this exhibition to talk about the exchange with technology that artists have, that it's not, um, that the works of art in the, in the gallery are not about the technology, mm -hmm. that it's about the relationship in the, to the creative process for an artist, that it's a, it's a tool that's being used and explored, that there's a give and take, and that uh, sometimes accidents happen and something beautiful happens in that. Um, and that actually brings me directly to a question I wanted to ask uh, David Berman, um, you wrote very early when you were describing the uh, the founding of the Sonic Arts Union that there was a desire to create pieces in which established techniques were thrown away and the nature of sound was dealt with from scratch. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, um, that's kind of an interesting way to think about approaching making something new, that you were getting rid of things that had come before and starting over again or starting new. I think it was a part of um the spirit of the 60s that um, in general people were wanting to throw, throw away the, the establishment. The establishment had become heavy and oppressive. And, uh, it was the years of the Vietnam War. I mean, it was a great uh, desire to throw away the establishment and do something fresh. And in music, uh, a lot of the musicians who were starting out then in the 60s uh, were experimenting with things that had never been tried before. Hmm. Uh, Steve Reich, for instance, with his uh, rhythm shifting, and uh, Lamont Young with his uh, extended drones and uh, high amplification and so on. So, yeah, for us, uh, we were a part of that world, of course, and we were uh, the Sonic Arts <coughs> members were, someone said uh, recently that we were uh, converting conceptual art to electronic music, which I had never actually thought of that before. <laughs> That's an interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and then specifically the, uh, in the 60s, um, well, from my point of view, if, if I were trying to do a piano piece or a string quartet, I would be up against the greatest minds of the previous 200 years. <laughs> but if I picked up a soldering iron and started uh, building things from transistors, which were brand new at that point, and trying to make audio circuits, uh, I was in competition with no one because no artists had done that before. Hmm. And I mean, I was just one of a number of artists who were going in that direction. There's always many, many different directions to go, right. of course. But you were really breaking new ground. This was, uh, you know, in... in uh, inventing new electronic instruments and tones and harmonics and triangle waves and that sort of thing. This was all, this was new territory. It was new territory, yeah, which, which was refreshing for me after being in a college and doing the traditional things. Yeah. Was that, um, well, I, I should, uh, that's kind of also a nice transition to, to Eve Sussman. Um, because I see a lot of new things in the production of the, the film through the serendipity machine. And I know that when we talked about the, the making of that film, which is continuously edited in real time, that that wasn't, that wasn't your initial approach to making that film, that the, the serendipity machine evolved out of that process. Uh, yeah, can you talk I mean, about that a bit? It ties into some stuff that both of these guys have said, but especially what Camille said about the tool kind of taking on a life of its own. I mean, you you develop something that you think is just a tool that maybe you're just going to use in the studio and not show to anybody and 
Um, and so, I mean, I, I do think a lot about traditional cinematic form, but yeah, then you're also you're up against that last hundred <laughs> years of cinematic form, right? Yeah. And so you think about, well, what can you do to, to stretch that idea of narrative and stretch that idea of cinema and really ask the question, what is a movie? Um, and I'm continually inspired by that question, what is a movie? And what makes a movie? And, and at what point yeah. are you no longer a movie anymore? Um, and so often I go out and shoot in a very improvised way, but it's still kind of cinematic in its aesthetic or in its approach, or there might be an actor or two. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if we go a little closer from the, further from the mics, we're not going to feed back so much. Um, and, but so building, creating an algorithm that could edit the film was at first a way of coming up with new approaches to scripting and new approaches to narrative, you know, that you could shoot a bunch of material and tag it and do a bunch of data mining on it and figure out ways of, of ordering it differently every time. Mm -hmm. And that might suggest a story that you never even thought of and also juxtapositions you never thought of. And often when you edit traditionally, which I've also done things where I've edited yeah, in a more sure. traditional style, still some of the best things that happen happen by mistake. You know, you chop a bunch of material up, you throw it in a timeline, and you look at it, and you're like, wow. And so it was partly like, well, how do you get those mistakes even more quickly? How do you generate those, those chances, those serendipities in a more efficient manner? And the way you do it in a more efficient manner is you have a computer do it. Yeah. You build an algorithm to do it. And, and so it, then you do think that that's just a tool for the studio, and it was something that me and the guy who was working with me editing were going to use privately. And then the tool kind of exploded and it became its own artwork. Like it, we realized it could take on a life of its own. It could be presented as a piece. And it was creating these poetic juxtapositions that had the qualities of an artwork. I mean, they, yeah. they were metaphoric and, and they were mysterious and they had a certain type of suspense that I was mm. interested in developing without necessarily having to have the confines of traditional narrative or spoon feeding the audience narrative. Part of what I'm interested in when people talk about interactive isn't necessarily that the audience can come in there and push buttons and do things, but that they create part of the artwork themselves in their head. Hmm. And so inevitably with Wet and White and with some other pieces I've done, the audience has an idea of what happened and they all have a very different idea of what happened. Um, and so that I think is quite interesting that, yeah. that the audience may not be pushing any buttons or they may not be choosing, you know, like they'll say, well, I want to see all the birds now. Can I type in birds? And I was like, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can type in birds, but you can't, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but you can invent the story. Right. And so part of what the Saturday Deputy Machine does is it allows you as, a, as the viewer to invent the story. Yeah. Um, but it is very much what Camille talked about, where the tool explodes and kind of walks away from you, and you have to let it do that. And the tools that you're making, all three of you, are, are really complicated and are sort of the result of, of vast collective efforts. I mean, I know, Eve, you work with the Rufus Corporation and, 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 and sort of inspire and employ uh, vast numbers of people to make works on, you know, in the, in the makings of films. Um, and Camille, you've collaborated not only on text rain, but with people on the making of the large architectural site-specific mm -hmm. stuff. And you're performing with uh, um, other musicians quite often. Um, uh, do you, how, do you, how does that uh, sort of technological communication happen? Um, is that something that, uh, that is very easy for you? When you're, are you speaking the same language with all of these people all the time? Or is it sort of a, uh, a much more complex conversation and argument? Well, of course, when you're working with technology, you're standing on the shoulders of tens of thousands of people <laughs> who have created the, the technology. Right. It used yeah. to be, you, as a craftsman, if you were playing a flute, you might be standing on the shoulders of a couple of hundred craftsmen. But now, yeah. it's it's such a uh, an immense yeah. global. <laughs> I I think um, the. Um, and considering my generation, I'm the oldest person here but uh, on this <laughs> platform. But uh, there's never been a time when uh, the tools available to artists have changed with such immense speed. Right. Starting yeah. with the 60s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, has been a absolutely bewildering. And there's, there's a lot of excitement of new, new things opening up. But there's yeah. also um, 
this terrible situation that you spend a lot of time doing work and then it's swept away hmm. and it's gone. I don't know if you've experienced that yet, but like 15-year-old yeah, I mean, I, uh, computer systems that no one bothers to boot up anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's a, you know, that's a growing problem for museums and museum curators as well. Cause we, uh, that's his job. That's, that's my job. You shouldn't worry about that. We've so. talked about that. Yeah, he yeah. promises to boot them up. Yeah, I'll keep them running, I promise. I think it's interesting, though, our culture, like, we don't even build buildings to last anymore. And then there's this crazy onus right. on artists to still make things that are going to be around in 100 years. And yeah. I'm not sure that it's yeah. just inconsistent, at the very least. It's like, why? You know. Yeah. No, I certainly, you know, I think that... Um, I don't think that it's, that it's the artist's responsibility to make something that's going to last a long time. I think that uh, you're responding so quickly to the environment around you that uh, you should just make it and leave it and leave us curators and conservators to deal with it. I mean, and what, and if I think everything, that, what if everything is yeah. conceived of as a performance? Yeah. I mean, that's sort of, yeah. that in a way, you know, like people in theater and dance maybe don't worry so much. I mean, I guess some people do. They have amazing archives and whatever. but. Some people realize when they're gone, they're gone, you know. Yeah. And I mean, there's a, there's a there's such a compelling uh, sense of performance with all of the artworks that are on view when you're watching them. That your, your physical presence in relationship to the work, either sitting or standing in front of it, or moving or uh, playing or participating in some other way. I think that 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 performative element is what sort of completes the contract uh, with the work itself. Um, so thinking of them as a performance that's a living thing, you know, the, um, it's certainly how uh, we as museum curators think about these works when we put them on view, that its lifespan is the beginning and the end of the exhibition, and then we have to uh, sort of set it aside and get ready for the next exhibition, the next, the next birth of that work. Um, I do think there's something, too, in this conversation. I think we've alluded to it. Also, like, as an artist, where are you? in relation to these tools in terms of like how low level or what, what how many other tools are you using that other people have made. Mm -hmm. And I think I got, you know, learning how to program is sort of a pain, but I decided that was really important because otherwise you're stuck like using Photoshop or using After Effects or using these tools that, uh, you know, are maybe made for artists, but they're certainly made with other interests in mind right. as well. And those are really amazing, valuable tools. but. It's kind of, and I think that's a personal decision for different artists. Like, do you, do you want to be kind of t at a tinkering level, you know, grinding pigment, or if, or are you happy to use paint out of tubes, or you know, like, where are you in that spectrum? Yeah. And I, I felt like it was exciting to be at the level where you could make something that you maybe couldn't make with the tools that were there mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because those mass marketed tools, the big software packages, they sort of imply you should do things a certain way. Mm -hmm. And you can sometimes uh, tell when you, I mean, when you hear a piece of music, oh, that's the program live. I mean, mm -hmm. and so uh, that's a problem for artists to get away from, yeah. from the, uh, the implications of the software packages. Well, and like, when, like you said, too, when you're making your own tools, then that has the possibility to turn into something else. Right. It's too. much easier for the thing to take on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm not a programmer at all, but I understand the potential of what happens when you build something, if not from scratch, then at least from components that you can't buy off the shelf. Like, they're, they're, they're there, but you have to know how to assemble them. And, um, and so they, yeah, they... They give you something that's just more unique and more specialized and has a view that's, that's just going to be your own. And, uh, and I think also what you said, you make mistakes. For like sure. definitely the work. So the original pieces I was doing with live video were closer to like texturing where you saw yourself there was a live video image. Um, and I was doing all these different experiments and some mistakes happened where it now it's kind of obvious in retrospect, but I hadn't thought about the screen as a drawing surface. It was very much a video still mm -hmm. to me in, in a lot of the early works I was doing that way. And then these kind of mistakes made me think like, oh, why couldn't that function in a really different way, even though it was still live? Like the video camera was still the input, but the screen didn't need to reflect that video right. tradition in quite the same way. It could be more connected to painting or other kind of mark making. So I, I don't think I would have made that leap if I didn't see those mistakes happening, like where the code wasn't doing what I meant, and then was like, oh, wait a minute. There's a, um, uh, a French essayist that I like very much, who uh, Paul Virilio, who wrote a, who sort of identified the, the 
an irony in invention itself, and in that if you if you harness electricity, you also invent electrocution, or if you uh, if you invent the train, you also invent derailment. So accidents are sort of inventions in their own right, and um, there's there's something sort of beautiful in thinking about the the roles that an invention plays and how it sort of opens up new ground for a territory, both in in sort of destructive ways, but also in, in you know, creative ways. Um, I don't know if, uh, maybe I'm the only one that finds that interesting, but. <laughs> um, well, I, I had an experience this last fall. I was at Wesleyan, and um, there were nine very smart graduate students in music. And we were talking about they wanted to, what they wanted to do. And it turns out all nine of them didn't want to work with computers. And that was a big surprise to me, because I just, sort of for years assumed this is where you do a lot of stuff. And I asked one of them why, and she said, because it's not subversive anymore. Mm. I thought that really, I've been thinking about that ever, ever since. You know. So what did it's they an interesting work statement. With? Well, that, of course, they worked on other things with various degrees of success or not. And actually, the thing is, the computer did, did get involved in their work, although they said they weren't focused on it. But it's almost inevitable these days. I think it's important to note that cloud music is not uh, computer-driven in any way. It predates yeah. uh, the computer. It's, yeah, it's it a was, purely electronic yeah, it was piece. Just, just before the computer entered my life. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as a side note, there's a letter from David very early in which he describes being inspired by the, the wind and water-driven musical instruments of Polynesia and Southeast Asia. Um, so there were really natural forces at work that you were then sort of channeling in the electronic devices that you were building. Um, and for me, uh, Robert Watts, who was a wonderful artist, who, he was the instigator of cloud music. He had the conceptual idea, the movement of clouds in the sky will make music change. And for me, that was, it was like a spark, it was a trigger, hmm. and uh, changed the direction of what I, what I was doing for a year. And, <laughs> and, uh, he, he was both uh, an artist who worked very expertly with all kinds of uh, media, and he had a wonderful workshop in a farm in Pennsylvania where he could work with wood, metal, plastic, right. and so on. But he had these conceptual ideas. And a another one was he had a piece called um, Tree Wind Painting. Yeah, I love that work. You know that? Yeah. He would, uh, uh, there was a beautiful tree on his farm, and he took these plastic uh, markers and he would put a great big piece of paper on the grass under the tree, and he would have uh, mount these uh, uh, markers from the branches. Right. And then he'd go home, and uh, the wind would blow, and then he'd come back the next day to harvest the art. Yeah. Yeah. And they were the pieces of paper he would lay down were usually small bore target paper, so like twenty two rifle paper. Oh, he liked uh, and, that, uh, image, that image. Yeah. yeah. So okay. missing the target, but finding yeah. something. Uh, yeah. With those, yeah. Yeah. Pretty extraordinary pieces. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd like to open it up for a couple of questions. I'm hoping, uh, and if you don't have any, I have, I have many, many more. <laughs> um, but if you'd like to use the microphones there on the, on the edges, please uh, chime in. Hi. Um, so as an audiovisual archivist here with other audiovisual archivists, um, and you touched a lot on um, long-term preservation and sort of how you're not necessarily thinking about it when you're creating the artwork, what are your um, feelings or, um, or ethical opinions about your artwork being migrated to more current, more stable formats in order to ensure the long-term preservation of your work? <laughs> You guys just yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, for me, the, the, uh, the circuitry that Bob Diamond and I made uh, in the 70s, um, it, was ignore it was just sitting in the basement for decades. And then, uh, thanks to Michael and John Hanhart, it <laughs> came here. But we weren't, of course, thinking about uh, 40 years later when we made it in the 70s. And I remember saving a few dollars. I mean, we were usually artists who were working with minimal resources are often. And I remember saving a few, there were, there were these Molex connectors that were cheaper than um, transistor, um, um, uh, the, uh, cheaper than the sockets. Mm -hmm. 
And so I bought a bunch of these Molex connectors, and I've probably saved $12. Well, <laughs> yesterday, uh, some of the circuits yeah. were acting up, and we had to pull the chips out of these Molex connectors. And I thought, gee, I wish I hadn't saved those $12. <laughs> I would say when we acquired uh, Cloud Music, we brought an archive uh, to the museum with it that includes all of um, the schematic diagrams and drawings that were sort of conceived and created during the making of the work. Um, and uh, I, they're, they're sort of fantastic drawings in their own right, but, um, and I couldn't understand a single thing on them, but I'm hoping that a conservator in the future will be able to uh, interpret what it is that they were doing and, uh, and, and keep the work running indefinitely. But um, it's, I think that uh, that's going to be a significant challenge for all three of the works that are, on the, that are represented here on the stage. Um, uh, we've, uh, as a sort of on the museum side of things, we sort of conceive of these as, a, as virtual objects and physical objects. Software packages would be sort of would be the virtual object that requires some preservation method, and then the physical object the, uh, requires a very different strategy. And um, we, uh, both fortunately and unfortunately, have to re meet those with all three of the works that uh, we acquired through you. So because they all have some sort of electronic virtual component and then a physical component. Um, Camille's in particular. Uh, uh, there are sort of optical and communication issues between the camera and the computer and the uh, projector and, the, and the, the evolving technologies present a number of challenges there. And then Eve's work, there's a, not only a library of video files, but this uh, completely unorthodox software program that uh, has to that interpret unorthodox, that. It's not unorthodox, but well, I think it's if, pretty a, new, unorthodox. if <laughs> a new platform, once the platform that runs it no longer exists, which is Mac OS, it, there will, someone will have to rewrite it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And how do you, but how do you feel about that? Like, I mean, ethically, do you feel? I mean, the piece is the piece, right? Sure. The piece, the piece is, a, is an experience, and so if you can make that experience happen on a different platform, I don't think it matters that much. Okay. Um, you know, it's, I mean, I guess there might, to me it's more about timing issues or something, like, you know, right. millisecond timings might be different, and that might make the whole thing feel different. I won't be here to tell you it feels different. <laughs> and Michael right. might know, but he probably won't be here either. Right. And so, I mean, and the two guys who really, the main collaborators, you know, they're a lot younger than me, but. <laughs> I, I, I think, like, I'm going to interject something here, but if even the people's experience looking at these things is, they're both in flux. So like when I think, you know, three by four aspect ratio is becoming a problem, you know, if you want a projector that's gonna project out a lot of them down res to that, but you know, that piece is three by four aspect ratio. So, and I know mm -hmm. Michael and I have talked about this with the name, a lot of the name Jim Paik work too, like you can't get CRT screens anymore which have this certain curve to it. Mm -hmm. But like the way those screens looked when that work was new to people was like high tech and now they look like antique. Mm -hmm. Right, so mm -hmm. you're always in relation to that. I mean, you know, and, and when we first showed TechStream in 99, people were like, how did you do that? And we're like, oh, you know, it's this program. They're like, no, how did you put that picture on the wall? Like, people weren't familiar with projection technology at that time. So, like, their very first question was just like, what am I even looking at? In a lot of the places we showed it. And now nobody cares about that. Like, it's like, yeah, of course that's a projector. Like, that's not the interesting <laughs> part. I mean, hopefully that was never the really interesting part, but, you know, just to say, like, we're, we're always having these different relationships with yeah. media, and I don't know how, as a curator, you account but for that. But to me, it, it goes back also to the idea of performance. Like, if, uh, you know, people do re-perform choreographies of choreographers that are long dead, and the whole dance company might be gone, you know, but they do recreate those choreographies. Are they exactly the same as they were done in 1920 or 1940? No. But there's an experience there, and that's, you have to decide, the, the next generation of curators or whatever will decide if that experience is worth creating, recreating. You know, people have arguments about it, you know, I mean, but if there was something, I don't know, like there, there, was, there was something satisfying and compelling and redemptive about that experience of that piece, then probably somebody will find a way to make it run just the way some, uh, you know, a, a dance company will, will find a way 
to redo, you know, a, a, a choreography that, that might be 50 years old. Um, so that's, I, I don't know, I mean, it also is like re replaying old pieces of music. They don't sound the same as they did when, when they were first heard in the Renaissance or the Middle Ages, so it doesn't mean people don't replay them. Uh, sometimes it's just clear that the uh, new technology has improved the whole situation. I mean, I fa found that with, uh, Michael found this uh, digital video camera which uh, adjusts to the ambient light. Right. And so uh, in the old days of showing cloud music, we were, we had to keep running to the camera to readjust it as the afternoon got deeper. <laughs> and th this camera just does it for you and it's just, it's just better. It's just better in 2015 yeah. than it was in... Although I'd like to see my AV technician running to the gallery every 30 minutes to adjust the <laughs> I'm sure he would love that. Well, and for me, it's but, the opposite, because uh, I don't want that kind of camera, because it screws up the tracking and texturing, so I'm always looking yeah. for the ones you right. can turn it right. off, because right. right. yeah. it's all right. automated now, so oh, yeah. a lot of cameras, you can't turn that yes. function yeah. off. Yes. Yes. Right. Here, not Depends to nerd out yeah. <laughs> what yeah. you're doing. Yes. Well, thank you. Hello. Um, can I ask a semantic question? I know the show is called Revelations in Media Art, and I just wanted to ask about <laughs> that. And, um, and you know. Sure. Yeah. Um, I chose the title Revelations as a because I was really um, trying to define the 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 sort of what it, just the striking disclosure that comes from works of art that are made with technology and, and the ways that they are very revealing in, uh, uh, in that way and, and in, looking at, um, uh, in looking at some works of art I, I, gener I sort of zone out for a moment and then there's a, there's a moment of clarity that I find in them. Uh, sometimes I'm mesmerized right away at the very beginning. Um, and uh, sometimes something sinks in with me over the course of months and then I come back to it and I'm like, I think there was something really rich in that work and uh, I think that is a revelation. Um, and so I very simply came up with, with that as a, uh, as a name. I didn't put a whole lot of thought into it so I apologize if, that, if there's a lot of focus <laughs> on that. But um, uh, I think it, this is, uh, these works are, wor of, are sort of revelatory. You know, there's, and, but I also wanted to draw a bit of uh, you know, focus on the revolution that is happening in artistic practices and in contemporary art studios around the world. Um, that uh, these boundaries of art making are continually be bro being broken down and uh, uh, White on White sort of thinks about cinema in a completely new way and, and Text Rain is, a, is, an, is a, a totally new interactive performance piece in the space just as cloud music I'll never look at the clouds the same way again because I'm always rooting for them to go a little further over to the left and get to that crosshair so I can hear what they sound like. Um, so that's sort of where the title of that work, I mean, of the exhibition came from. Hello. I'm very interested in the role of the audience in all of your works because they're so much more interactive than traditional media is. And I'm curious about whether you consider your works on their own with no audience present the same work as when an audience member is present and interacting with it or whether it's not actually the work until someone is viewing and interacting with it or some third pro proposition that you might come up with. Do you want me to go first? Me to go first? Um, <laughs> okay, is it the same work if there's an audience, that's a little bit like if a tree falls in the forest. Um, you know, and nobody hears it. Um, I guess I feel like if it's running, somebody is looking at it, probably, even if it's just me or me and Kevin or Jeff, the two guys who mainly collaborated on it with me. So even if it's just like one of us looking at it, we're interpreting what we're seeing and so I do feel like in the case of white and white it is kind of the same work with um, whether or not there's an audience there but that might be different in the case of say Camille's work I don't know um, yeah I was just thinking of a way to wrap my head around that because obviously with text rain not all my work is interactive so I, I do other kinds of work too that 
use software to generate things, and they're always different. Like they're they're um, the code allows for this space of possibility, kind of mm -hmm. what he's talking about. It's always recombining things or making things slightly differently, but there isn't a person causing that to happen. Another person, an audience member. Um, but I, in my head, while I was thinking, you know, if you see a video of someone else interacting with TechStrain, to me, that's not the piece. Like, it is your experience of being in that space and kind of, I mean, I think people have this proprioceptive thing that happens where they actually feel the text. People have told me this, maybe not everyone, but to me, it's like that experience of being in this other space and thinking about your body and the text in a, a different way is the piece, not just the image of the piece. Mm -hmm. So for that piece, you need to be there. And um, we were talking about this too in, in terms of working with dancers. Like I've had a lot of choreographers that are interested in working with me. And I finally just did a collaboration this fall um, with Mark Ferringer in San Francisco. But I resisted that for a long time because to me, the audience experience of like watching dancers on the stage interacting with the system isn't the experience I was most interested in, because then you're watching other people interacting with the system. I really wanted you to have that experience. So. I was uh, thinking of, uh, there are some artists who work with that issue of uh, the difference between someone being there and not. I'm thinking of uh, Mary Lucia has some installations uh, where mm -hmm. um, uh, you enter a gallery and there, there's just, uh, you'll go to a, look at a video uh, monitor, nothing will be happening, but if you go close to it, uh, it wakes up and someone starts talking to mm -hmm. you. And uh, I also, myself, I had the experience, I had a, a piece that was sort of a cousin of cloud music where there was um, uh, a video camera looking into a gallery. And I thought, well, the, the poor person who has to uh, take care of the gallery all day <laughs> is going to be driven crazy by this constant sound. So I'll have the piece get very quiet. Uh, unless people come in and then it gets louder while people are there and then it subsides again. So, yeah. Yeah. I would say the, um, this is a bit of a, an aside, but the, um, the, the work that really changed my perspective on media art is a work by Gary Hill called Tall Ships um, that I helped install when I was a first year student in Houston at college. Um, and uh, it's another projection piece in a long hallway that um, uh, your presence activates the piece, but your absence, uh, you assume, means that those, those projections aren't doing anything. And I, I suddenly realized there was an interactive thing happening um, that could be accessed in an entirely new way, and um, that the, the presence and your relationship to a work of art was uh, something really unique. Um, What's that? I love that piece. I, yeah. I was also very struck by that piece. So. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a different Gary Hill in the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> very different. That one. Very different piece. Um, I do wonder though sometimes, like I just heard a talk by Svetlana Alpers, an art historian in, uh, at Stanford, and she was kind of bemoaning that we don't take time anymore. You know, that in part because of all our media is reacting to us all the time, that people have become so sort of twitchy that if something doesn't change or react right away, we just like walk away from it. Mm. Um, but right. I, I don't think that that's, again, this goes back to making your own tools. Like that's not necessarily, I don't think that that is a necessary component of interactive media. So one thing I realized about TechStream after making it, after quite a while of watching it is it definitely rewards this kind of activity of movement, but it also, the easiest way to read the poem is if you stand still, right? And I think there's like, mm. that's a component mm. of interacting can mean reacting to stillness and there's not, but we're kind of like still so obsessed with the fact that it can react to us once you do something like press a button or do something that I think we're, I think we will come back around to that as a, yeah. there's, there's a richness of ways that these media can be reactive or interactive for those of us that want to work that way. Yeah. Um. Hi, uh, thanks so much for your work. Um, in all of this talk about um, interactivity and, and the role of the, the spectator or the inhabitant in the space, I'm also struck by the ways in which you, all three of your work um, in some ways decenters uh, the human uh, in, in really interesting ways. I mean, with 
uh, with David's piece, you know, it's, it's about the clouds and the behavior of the sky. And Eve's piece, the decisions are being made by, by, this, by, by the software um, in a moment-to-moment moment -moment basis. And Camille, in your, in your piece, um, you know, the, the text is also sort of forming uh, in its own patterns. Uh, regardless, not in, in, in exchange with human movement, but as you just said, it also the easiest way to read it is when you're not moving. So I'm wondering if, if you have thoughts about um, whether the work is supposed to make us think about things besides the human, or, or the human in relationship to other systems, uh, be it weather, or text, or software. I mean, I think this question of systems is a really important one for us as human beings right now. I mean, if you look at the environment, that's a pretty big system that we're involved in, and we, we sort of understand how, but we're not quite wrestling with that in a, in a very quick way, right? You know, so that, um, I do think that that's something that or any work that's sort of code-based helps us think about these larger relationships that we're part of. So I would say yes in my... In my situation, I'm interested in that. Like it's when you know, I'm interested in these bounds of rules that you're making that instantiate the work. But I mean, that goes back. There's a long history of that. Actually, I was at the Man Ray show at the Phillips Collection today, and he has a piece I think from the 20s, um, you know, which is an instruction set for how to hang a bunch of coat hangers together to make a piece. So and, you know, follow it. Like there's there, the idea of rules as a way to create a piece from those rules is not something new. But I, I think that it might be an increasingly pressing issue as we are more interconnected with our, all of the systems we're part of. Yeah, we're, you could say we're kind of in a situation where we're mesmerized by the, uh, the onrush of technology. We're like a deer uh, with her eyes caught in a headlight. I mean, we're always waiting for the next miracle to happen. And I think we have to think carefully about it. How we how we react to the the onrush of technology and artists have, as you were saying, you have to have a a way of positioning yourself. Yeah. Run up here. Thinking of technology, with, uh, with a lot of art, it's uh, confined to a gallery or a museum uh, the, or an installation of some sort. With a lot of the immersive technologies coming up, VR kind of making a bit of an impact this year, have you given any thought to how you may be able to work or create these kind of experiences that until now have been limited to places, but when suddenly that place becomes maybe a little more portable. Portable, you said? More portable. Mm -hmm. hmm. You mean like have, being able to have some kind of experience like that on your iPhone or something? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're this year and in the next couple of years, uh, we're going to see a lot more of the virtual reality technology is coming to market. Uh, so you'll be able to explore three-dimensional worlds, similar to the kind of interaction that you would have in a physical space. Mm -hmm. The one, I'm, I'll speak to that. Um, when, at the time I was making Text Rain, we were also doing a lot of experiments with headsets where I was in school at NYU with the Interactive Telecommunications Program. Um, and VR was a big thing then. And then the internet kind of took over from it and it went into the background and now it's sort of resurging in a way. Um, I was personally not interested in how you have put on this headset, now it's a smaller headset or whatever, but you're kind of going into this world alone. And I think that um, also giving, um, allowing our eyeballs to be like our main way of experiencing is just, it's not how we evolve. Like we are so, we are so richly aware of our physicality and we sometimes, I think, more and more are forgetting that with all our little screens everywhere. Um, so for me, making a piece that 
gave you both a way to feel like you're in this different kind of experience. You're catching letters. But like, I'm really aware if Eve is standing next to me in the gallery space, and we can cooperate and create a social situation between us. So that was something that was very important to me about technology that I think is, is still not really being addressed by a lot of the VR technologies. I mean, something like if it gives you a way to communicate with someone who's on the other side of the world, maybe that's a benefit. But I don't think, again, I think there's a lot of our physicality that is ignored by those systems. Um, and it's important stuff that, that isn't accounted for. Not to say that you can't do interesting things with it, but I don't, I'm less interested in that than thinking about how technology brings us back into our current spaces and in relation to each other in those spaces. And I think that um, uh, sort of from a cura curatorial perspective, um, I'm going to defend the museum. <laughs> the physical I gallery space I of the museum. I'm quite intrigued by the, the, the interpersonal piece. Yeah, well, you know, I think that it, there's, there's something to be said for uh, the role of the museum in, um, you know, we, we took a lot of, there, there was a lot of effort given to placing these works in dialogue with one another, but also within sight of one another so that you could see these works together. But I think that the, the museum itself is a, has kind of a civic responsibility to create a safe place to ask questions. And you can physically engage these works, not only these works, but all works of art in, in a, in a sort of a space that's been dedicated to that conversation. And those are things that might not be available elsewhere in the world, certainly not in, in you know, the troubling times we live in now. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in the safe confines of the Smithsonian American Art Museum <laughs> in Washington, you can, you can come look at all of these ideas in one place. And um, your physical presence in relationship to those pieces is, is critical. Um, I mean, there's a but, theatricality that, to any space like this that I think is actually important. And um, I mean, when people say to me, well, why can't I watch such and such online? I'm like, well, it's the same reason that when you go see a play in the theater, they don't come and perform in your living room. You know, I mean, that would be interesting <laughs> too. And I'm not saying that shouldn't happen. But going to the theater is going to the theater and there's special things about the theater that make it a theatrical condition and a museum is a theatrical condition and and so I'm not saying that I only want to make works that can be in a theater or a museum setting um, but yeah I don't love the small screen I don't even like watching things on a computer um, and I still do love the cinematic so for me it's not that the portable isn't an option but um, but I, I, I am still enamored of some of these traditions, and some of them are cinematic and theatrical traditions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a way, the uh, technology in audio, it's kind of, in a way, you could say it's a dumbing down of the audio experience, that everything is millions of people listening to things on their two headphones. And uh, I just <laughs> think, I, I just hope live performance is always uh, around and important. Right. And yeah. analog as well. I mean, there's a reason there's a resurgence of vinyl even, you know, yeah. that people are yeah. buying record players again because it yeah. sounds different than all this digital stuff, yeah. you know. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. the mm. conversation. Hello. Hi. I want to say... Oh, oh hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you. You've all created really beautiful pieces of art. I wanted to ask a question specifically for cloud music. I'm really interested to know, Mr. Berman, how uh, your involvement with music composition uh, was in a way special when coupled with such technology. Um, you can get very technical. I'm really interested to know uh, the microtonal structure or anything you can talk about in that respect. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you for asking. But, um, at that time, in the early 70s, mid-70s, I was working with um, uh, basically cord, cord clusters, thick cord clusters uh, made by um, electronic generators. And then when Bob Watts had this idea of uh, the movement of clouds changing music, it just seemed that the chords, uh, chordal changes were somehow fit, fit the bill. And th they change in loudness. Actually, in the cloud music piece, there's no, um, 
there's no glissandos, but some of the other work I was doing, there were changes of loudness and tuning and uh, sliding pitches. And um, it's just, it, it just happened that what I was interested in seemed to fit with this conceptual idea. And then there were technical issues, how to make it happen and have, how, to, how to have the, uh, the tunings not go out of tune. And that was a big uh, technological stumbling block for me that year because I hadn't worked with digital sound until cloud music. There's one master oscillator and then all the pitches are divided off that so it won't go out of tune. Mm -hmm. um, does that Yes, that's okay. amazing. Um, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll yeah, add to just that just that there's a... Um, uh, we included uh, in the exhibition space with Cloud Music a series of letters and schematic diagrams of the, of the, during the creation of the work. And there's a, there's a really fantastic page from a letter by Robert Watts in which he's describing how Cloud Music works. And he draws a little picture of the camera and has it connected to the video analyzer and then to the synthesizer. And down in the bottom hand, right hand corner there's a series of musical scales um, that say David's music. But the he created a little line triangle star diagram down there that doesn't look anything like music at all. It's an entirely new sort of, yeah. you know, schematic of what yeah. was representing your yeah. sound. And yeah. I, I found that really kind of fascinating, mm. you know, in describing this new sound you were going to hear. It doesn't look like music. It looks like this thing, mm. you know, on a musical scale. So. Actually, the waveform uh, is triangle waves. Right, yeah. It's almost exactly yeah. like that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so the harmonic combinations were... Um, you decided upon them before, or how, how does um, the change of <clears throat> scenery, because it happens so randomly, how do they couple so well together? I didn't hear anything go out of tune, so that uh, was my... Uh, well, well there, were, there were, with this uh, digital scheme, there were maybe, I don't know, 40 pitches available, and then each, each, each crosshair can make uh, eight changes in tuning. And so it was just, at that point, it was more or less personal preference, uh, you know, to choose chordal combinations that I liked, basically. Um, but but with, it's, it's always a help uh, in a, when you're trying to do art to, be, to have limitations. Um, and uh, because then you're, you're not, you don't have infinite choices which can <laughs> stop you from, can paralyze you. So in this case, I had only those 40, 40, pitch, 40 or so pitches to choose among, and so it was very finite. I could do this or this or this, and that was it. So, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, first, a comment and uh, then a question. Uh, David, when you were speaking about the limitations of audio, suddenly I remembered. Uh, my uh, visit to Alcatraz, and uh, I was standing above the, uh, uh, the floor, and I was watching people uh, uh, with the acoustic guide uh, listening to uh, the tour and doing a dance, and you could you could tell where they were in the tour, you know, when they turned around, and so there was a real and Eve, this gets to you know uh, the theater. There was a real theater to watching the people uh, as they uh, reacted, uh, going to the next point, etc. So uh, it, was a, it was a new experience for me. Question, I'm a technologist, but I'm also a human being, and the reason that I'm an artist is to connect with other human beings. And I've been struck by the conversation tonight has, that it has focused a lot on technology, on the technology that we use. And Camille, you've, um, uh, you mentioned a little bit of, uh, about the emotional component of the, of the poem, but I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear about uh, the emotions or the human interactions or the human uh, experience, um, uh, say, with uh, Eve's piece. I found it very, um, very current, uh, current in uh, our relationship with uh, Russia, uh, uh, 
watching uh, the TV show The Americans, uh, sort of a nostalgia <laughs> uh, look back at the 80s and Reagan and, and Russia. So there was a, I, I connected with the piece uh, there uh, in, in an emotional, historical fashion. And I'd like to know if you could speak uh, a little bit, each of you, uh, more about, you know, um, what we get traditionally out of art is some, you know, not just an interaction with the technology, but uh, some emotional uh, quality to the work. Okay. Oh, you want me to start? <laughs> um, well, a little bit what Camille was saying is, you know, I think that doesn't all, it can happen with a, a completely static painting and sculpture as well, that whatever your audience takes away is going to be different. But with these works, because they do have an, a big element of chance to them. Um, the, the emotional re response and reaction and is, can be quite different. And so it is always really interesting to see what, when people do come back and talk to you about their the emotional component or the, the real art of it, you know, the, the metaphorical component, right? That it, it, can, it can really run the gambit. Um, but um, my, I mean, my pieces, as Michael pointed out, there's 3,000 video clips and about 150 pieces of music and 80 of these little narratives, whether they're monologues or dialogues or whatever. Um, and then there were all kinds of references to the history of film and, you know, whether it's Alphaville or Tarkovsky or you know, those, those kind of references are in there. Um, but one of the most gratifying things for me is actually a, a conversation that I had with somebody last night. But I've, and I've sort of had similarly odd conversations about this, these few um, storylines that are within the piece. And so I never know if people are going to, what they're going to catch in on or how they're going to combine the storylines or how the computer's going to combine it for them or how they put it together in their own heads. But this woman came up to me last night and insisted that one of the storylines in the piece, which is about language being rationed, and there's a, there's a kind of a whole bunch of little narratives about language rationing. And she insisted that it was from a Russian film that she knew. And, um, and she wanted me to remind her what that film was. And I said, that film doesn't exist. But she really insisted that the film must exist. And that she knew that she had seen that story in a, either in a piece of literature or, or, a, or a movie. And I said, as far as I know, it's not in a, in a movie or a piece of literature that I know of because I wrote the story. Um, and it took a while for her to believe that. And then she really insisted that I make that movie. Um, and so it, it, was, it was such a weird circular thing, but it was quite an emotional conversation, both her loving the idea of the language ration and then finally asking me, well, if it's not from a movie and it's not from a book that you know or I know, then where is it from? And I said it was from me being a six-year-old and having a friend of my parents who talked too much and I really wanted her to run out of words. And then she really believed that I hadn't stolen the story from an, from an existing book and movie when I finally told her that it was from my childhood. Um, so that's my little emotional story. My <laughs> next. I mean, I guess, like a lot of works, there's lots of different levels. Um, so I'm trying to think of what, what's the one I want to talk about. I mean, I really like um, that in the kind of interactive works that I like the best of, that I've made, there's, um, there's a moment where people in the installation, I mean, you just see people having fun or whatever, but I actually I had someone in a, in a uh, panel once ask me, is it only about fun? I think he was German. <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's just a, a play. Is it only about play? Um, so I think there's an importance to that play asking, but I, I think the real importance is that people are posing questions and then testing them out. Um, so in when I do artist talks, there's a clip um, of a little boy interacting with Texarine where he happened to have an umbrella because it was raining out. Um, and he realizes he can catch the letters on the umbrella, but then he flips the umbrella upside down to try to catch the letters on the inside of the umbrella. And to me, there's, that is, there's an, the emotional content in that of like trying to understand your agency and what are the bounds of this system. That, and, and I think there's the connection between this poem that's in the piece too and, and how much you can or can't figure that out. You know, I don't think most people can read the poem, but you catch little glimpses of it. So there's this sense of like, 
what are those boundaries of yourself as a person in what you can do with the system I've set up or how you can even communicate you know with other people and um, so there's there's something of that like balance in there for me and if I can add something to to your work <laughs> Um, one of the important uh, aspects about that installation is that there's enough room in the middle that you can uh, interact with people that are also experiencing the work so it becomes a, a kind of uh, something that happens between people that it's not isolated to an individual experience of the work but that, mm -hmm. uh, that something happens between people and that, that was kind of important in the making. Mm -hmm. um, Any more questions? I think we're coming to the end of our time. But, uh, oh, we have good. Thank you for the wonderful discussion. Um, I was wondering if you have considered your tool making as a political action because I believe that what artists or art can do to technology like straight out of corporate media labs is like adding like different things <coughs> to it. Like um, Tabor mentioned that like we need to be really careful about how we react to current technology, um, try not to be swept off by it. So I was wondering um, your own like tools or software developed on your own end can do something like in order to change the status quo or like the way in which we act to the current technology. You know, I think that um there's uh, I think that there's something to be said in, in the way in, about the ways in which artists are are not only making technologies making new technologies to create new works of art but also investigating the roles that older technologies have played in shaping our visual culture or just sort of communal culture um, and uh, I don't I'm always concerned that um, uh, we're putting too much emphasis on the political statement behind artworks and not allowing the artwork to really speak for itself and to allow people to interpret it in their own manner. Um, a lot of the artworks here have, you know, they've, they've really created their own, I mean, they, they, new technologies were invented in their making and they're sort of giving us new ways to look at uh, sort of the world around us in general. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, changing the status quo or, you know, intentionally trying to affect the, the status quo. I think that's, um, you know, all art is revealing in one sense or another. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that even comes close to addressing your question, but there's sort of a, you know, I think, I think that's, a, that's a big issue uh, in, in contemporary art today. But um, I, I think there is an important, I don't think in my work it's overtly political, but I think there's, I've always thought of these pieces as kind of hypotheses that you're putting out there. Like, what if, I mean, again, it's hard to even think back, like, 1999, right, when text rain was first shown, nobody had phones with screens on them, so we already had a very different relationship to technology, but my hypothesis was, like, why does this amazing, these amazing possible systems have to only react to, like, our fingers? Like, that's just so poor and small. You know, I mean, there's amazing things in text in there too, but like, what about the rest of us? So to me, putting these possibilities or like with cloud music, like what, could we have music that reacts to the clouds, right? Like it, there's these amazing kind of hypotheses that you put out there as an artist. And mm -hmm. I feel like that is political and that it opens space in a kind of dialogue or what is a movie? Like, is, is that a fixed thing or is there a room there? I think those, you know, they're, they're not engaged. Well, I'm, yeah, I'll leave it I, Yeah, sorry, go no, ahead. No, I, 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 go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to say that I, I think um, of the three works that here, uh, certainly White on White has a, um, perhaps one of the most uh, politically engaged bases, you know, sort of. Well, there's, a, there's sort um, of a, a paranoid-inducing, you yeah. know, idea <laughs> about, I mean, which is, which is also sort of classic film noir, but it's. Yeah. It's playing with the idea of you know a character who's con constantly under surveillance and controlled by things outside of his power, and then the movie itself is also controlled by things outside mm -hmm. of its power, and then then the thing gets away from me, the maker, and I'm no longer in control of it either, really. Um, except that I guess I can shut it off, you know. <laughs> but I mean, not anymore. You I can, can shut it off. Turn it off, right? Not anymore, because now I'm giving it to Michael. Um, 
but I mean, yeah, I am, I am really interested in the frustrations that come of being a being in this world that we mm -hmm. live in where, yeah, you know, we, we know we're all being watched and there are all these things that are really frustrating about that and we're kind of powerless against it. And certainly, narratively and emotionally speaking, thank you for taking the question outside of the technological realm. That was, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, there's there is this powerlessness that we have as human beings in that we've all that we always have. We've we, we, we've always had this sort of powerlessness, and then we create all these technologies that are supposed to make us more powerful and more <laughs> empowered, mm -hmm. and then they work against us. And so there's this constant battle, and um, and there's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that. And so within the narrative that is created in White on White, the character is suffering from those things, and some of the monologues or dialogues are really, you know, simple phone conversations that we've all had whenever we call, like, customer service or tech support. I mean, they're literally lifted from those, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, I'm offshore. I mean, at one point, you know, you call, you call about something and the person you're talking to, you know they're offshore. You know? and, and that's in there, you know, because that's sort of the basic kind of, they're offshore, but they can see you, and tough, you know, that's the way it is. I think uh, in, in my corner of the music world. It's such a, the music world is very vast, but I'm very interested in overtly political music. But I, I think uh, one has to be very careful that it shouldn't be gratuitous if you make a piece with overtly political content. There, there are some wonderfully uh, powerful pieces. For instance, I don't know if you know Frederick Shevsky's music, but he has a piece called Attica, which is a very powerful piece about the, uh, the riots and the violence and everything. Uh, for me, occasionally, here and there, I've done pieces that have an overtly political character, but not very often. <laughs> but uh, there was one in uh, 2004, there was the Republican convention in New York City, and a lot of people were arrested. And uh, I heard a, a I, record, I recorded a program from WBAI, which was a lawyer telling people what to do, how to behave if you're arrested. And I used that as the text of a piece because I thought my, my very small audience knows more than I do about politics probably and is more active politically than <laughs> I am. But this text gave information about what you should do if you're arrested. I thought that's useful. Uh, <laughs> and the piece was called Useful Information. And, uh, it was, I think, partially successful. And anyway, that's, so it's, it's always on my mind, but um, it's, I think you have to question yourself. When, I mean, you have to be very honest with using politics in, in art. I, mean, you have to I think, yeah, it very that. quickly yeah. can become didactic in a yeah. way that's unfortunate. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I think we are at the end of our evening. Um, but uh, I, again, I'd like to say thank you to our three artists, Steve Sussman, Camille Letterback, and David Berman. I think uh, we we're really thrilled to have you here, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, stay tuned to our calendar over the course of the summer. We have a number of other additional programs um, uh, covering all, uh, any manner of topics uh, related to the exhibition. So I hope you come back and, uh, and spend more time with us. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. What was that? <laughs>